Legion Games, baby! Hey, Legion Games. Chris, what's up? So, this week on crowdfunding. Lots of stuff out there, tons of stuff launching, tons of interesting projects. But there's a little bit of everything in between. And what's with the opening? Well, if you know, you know. <laughs> I'm just, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, won't go into too much other details, but in the comment section, if you know, let me know that you know. Apart from that, let's talk board games. Let's talk what's new. Like I said, there's a little bit of everything this week. A little bit of everything. And way too much stuff to cover, but we're going to try anyway. So let's take a look. Let's get right into it. If you want to help me, help me get to 5K by the end of the year. I would most appreciate it. Thank you. That's all. Let's do this. First up, Zuli. At least I'm assuming that's how it's pronounced. It is already funded $2,500. This is an interesting uh, sort of pass and pick, if you will. I believe it's something like that. It's more of a drafting game, if you care to use that term instead. And what you have are 10 different animals. What, eight different enclosures that you're going to be picking from? And then something like five different environments? Or let me see. Eight enclosures, five upgrade types. And so basically, you have to design your own little card zoo when you're picking them and drafting them and then playing them at the end of your turn you're balancing what the enclosure can hold but also the type of animals because there's more of a thematic aspect so if an animal is considered fierce they can't be placed in another animal's enclosure as well and then you're using sort of uh, some arithmetic here when you're scoring here at the end uh, in terms of five times one two plus two times one so minus two so i mean there's some mental math that you're going to be trying to figure out from that side of things in terms of scoring your park at the end of the third round uh they break down a little bit of the cards here the basic price point is actually 18 dollars for the copy of the standard edition and then 21 for the extra stickers and sticker sheet so i mean that's about it it's it's a nice little drafting uh design your own uh playable card game with a high amount of replayability with the variety there and a little bit of asymmetric abilities in terms of how the animals are related to each other and what you have to be aware of. So all in all, nice little game. Zuli, check it out. Next up, I covered this one last week on the upcoming video, but there was no information about it. So we're going to talk about what a Viking's Tale, the tactical card game is, because it's already 150% funded at almost $9,500. So what do you need to know about this tactical card playing game? The gist of it is you're going to be drawing a hand of cards of seven cards and no more when you're refilling in between rounds. And you're going to be trying to score the most fame points by defeating other people's Vikings or other creatures in the game. And depending on the number of players, you are going to be having creature stacks. And all you're doing on your turn is drawing those cards and then equipping them to a hero, a Viking in front of you, choosing where that Viking goes in terms of said stacks, and then equipping them with other cards in your hand, and then having the ability to play one destiny card that is played face down that can be revealed so that it can change what happens in the battle, or it can influence not only yours, but other people's battles as well for a little bit of potential interaction and take that. So that is the gist of it. You're getting 20 different Vikings, 44 creatures, 18 destinies, 26 equipment cards. There you go. That is the gameplay in a nutshell. What's the cost here? Let's see. Print and play. $21. Okay. So another $21. And that's it. There's no deluxe. There's no extra. It's just that's what it is. Uh, they have the rules on here. That's where I got that information from. They have a few videos if you're interested from that side of things. A few stretch goals that they're hitting uh, potentially right here. And yeah, there you go. Shipping is going to be what it's going to be. It's a little expensive for what it is, for almost uh, half the price of the game. Or actually, let's see. Is that? Yeah, that's almost the whole price of the game. So, I mean, I guess you really want to like it from that side of things. Maybe more from a Europe standpoint, this would be better. But there you go. That is Viking's Tale in a nutshell. Nice quick summary. Nice quick game. Check it out. Next up, this is one of the ones I'm most interested in this week. Uh, they're going to be sending me a preview prototype copy whenever one becomes available and this is from Dronda Games Solar Sphere. You may recognize a little bit of the artwork in the box because they did the other cooperative game Solar Storm which same company same theme but this is instead of a cooperative version this is a competitive version utilizing area control dice worker placement as well as resource management. And if those things are striking your fancy, and if you like, especially the dice side of things, we don't see this done as much. And so that's why it's very interesting to me because dice worker placement is one of the few worker placement games I will 
potentially enjoy. Spoilers. Anyway, so they are already over 300% funded, which is incredible. Uh, I think this is easily more than what SolarStorm had altogether. So that's really exciting, especially if I'm sure that they're ecstatic about. So let's take a look at what it is. Uh, $45 for the base game, and it's coming with a Kickstarter exclusive uh, pack, if you will. A few gameplay things, a few non-gameplay things. There is also a five to six player expansion, and there is a playmat they are offering at higher bundles for $87 and $68 in that sense. So what are you actually doing and why would you want to play this game? So you are taking on the role of like one of these three factions that is trying to build this Dyson Sphere because the sun has run out of energy and you're trying to get a new energy source, essentially. And your dice are your ships, your drones that you are utilizing on your turns in order to collect resources. And you're going to be rolling them. And higher numbers give you higher priority, but lower numbers give you higher morale, which is important in terms of how you're interacting with the corporations and the bonuses that you can get for being as active or highly thought of with those corporations in the first place here you can see a little bit of just you know everything that you're getting and okay that's great here's the expanded with the expansions box that i mentioned screen printed robots all of that fun stuff and the expansion box okay here you go five players corporate droids expansion white dwarf expansion which has a new rondel style location system which is actually that's probably the most interesting to me i don't never gonna play this game at five people but this the white dwarf expansion with the rondel because i really like rondel when it came to glenmore 2 which is a surprisingly amazing game for someone like myself who isn't usually in that style of games here you have the Kickstarter exclusive pack. You have the screens on the ships. You have asymmetric powers that are going to be with the factions and the players as well, giving them a starting bonus and a player power. And your crew is going to be utilized throughout this game. And that's interacting with a the crew there as well with those asymmetric powers, because you may be gathering new crew, but you also may be getting bonuses when you retire said crew in the first place. Uh, here you go. Some of the stretch goals, expansion, stretch goal, Kickstarter pack, stretch goal. I mean, again, just great. Great, great, great mechanisms that I mentioned. So what else is there? Okay, so this is what you're doing. You're not only building your crew, you are fighting off resistance forces because there is going to be a force going against all of you. And if you do not fight him off or fight them off as a group, you can potentially lose significant progress. But you're also highly rewarded by the person who does the most against them gets a better reward than the others. Multi-use drones, those are the dice that I was just mentioning, and the morale allows you to achieve other objectives, as I mentioned, with those lower number die in order to mitigate getting lower numbers being rolled when you're rolling dice at the beginning of the game. Now, obviously, there's also a solo mode if we're going to have a worker placement style game in the first place. So all you solo junkies out there, you'll have your fix as well. So, I mean, it, all in all, it looks, it looks like a great game. I have very little concerns about it from that side of things. Again, it's just whether or not it's a question for you. Here you go, docking your ships, doing those uh, die rolls and the ex explanation of the dies that I talked about up there, calling those favors in from the corporations, deploying them to locations to get resources or even requiring certain dice to go there, uh, using your drones. And you only have so many and you can only uh, use them so often. You can recycle them to get uh, resources. Again, hiring the crew that I mentioned, building the sphere in the first place of what you're trying to do as the objective. And then there's also saying that while well, you're not just building the same sphere every time, there's a variable scoring condition. And again, resistance that you're fighting off that I mentioned as well. So expansions, the robot expansion, the white dwarf expansion. I like the rondel system. I think that's great as something different. I don't think rondels are used enough. It's probably the most highly underrated mechanic that I see, but I think it's hard to do as well. So there you go. Uh, the solo mode, solo mode, videos, 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 videos. Uh, we talked about the price points. Retailer shipping is going to be what it's going to be. It's very reasonable, actually. Uh, eight bucks. That's great. So, um, like I said, I'm going to have a hands-on copy of this. So, I will hopefully have your thoughts out there by the end of this campaign because there's 28 days left. And it's probably going to come close to breaking 100,000 at this rate, if not more. So, all in all, Solar Sphere looks really solid. Check it out if you're interested. Now, usually I don't talk about this stuff, but we're going to talk uh, painting now because it is tabletop adjacent in terms of painting miniatures. So, I mean, this is a lot of money. So let's check it out. I have no clue who this person is, but obviously uh, with all of these coats and all of this money, it must have a good reputation. Um, how to paint and getting 15 bottles for 55 bucks. That's over three bucks a bottle. That's about average on Kickstarter from what I've seen. So, I mean, getting a whole bunch of bases. 
So they're actually giving bases along with some of this stuff that you can paint and miniatures. So again, cool stuff. I don't know. I just thought I'd mention it for all you uh, miniature junkies out there that don't have stuff painted like me and have way too much gray sitting. Well, you know. So there you go. Next up, we have the Game of Hunt, Family Magnetic Board Game, which is actually four mini games all rolled into one using magnetic pieces with a board so that, you know, in case you jostle the table or jostle the board, I mean, the purpose of it is so that you don't have to reset things or wonder where things were in the first place. Now, this is very interesting. It's got mechanics like playing cards, selecting, teleporting around. Now, there is, say there's some storytelling and role playing. I mean, okay, sure. Um, but the gist of it is you have these four different games in this book that are going to be taking those various actions and slightly different nuances and utilizing them from a kid's side of things to create replayable, enjoyable games. And so you can see a little bit of what there is right there. And then they go through a little bit of, uh, what they actually have in this game. Trash monster, where trash is appearing all over town and a monster and why he's doing it. Uh, mushroom forest you're trying to find mushrooms for the favorite soup but the mushrooms are magical and if you pick the wrong one you magically get teleported and you may lose the mushrooms you have to begin with then another planet where you're only discovering that you know these winds on this planet as you're trying to uh, gather resources are blowing you all over the place and using the forecast to basically protect the planet and save it and monkey temple as these strange symbols are appearing all over the temple as you uh, press them they change directions or they change pattern and how they're moving and you have to figure out the pattern in order to solve the puzzle so that is a quick summary of all four of them there's a few videos here that talk about it they have a rule book called the book of rules but the basic gist of it is you're going to either be moving you're going to be teleporting you're going to be swapping cards or you're going to be discarding cards to do other actions and that is true they say uh in the rule book and they have a 20 page rule book that breaks down each of the four different games that i just mentioned here in terms of the mushrooms another planet the monkeys the trash all four of those things but the basic gist of them is all the same right here one of the free following actions move interact teleport swap cards discard and draw as many as you need well, as discarded. So that is the gist of it, and just the nuance of it changes between the games. Now, this is only over 10% funded, and so it's really interesting to see. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've said this before. I've said this uh, other places. Kids' games are a very small niche, and you have to have something that is just overwhelmingly appealing, and that's the trouble. And again, I don't think it's uh, just one of those that um, is flying under the radar, too. It just doesn't probably help it too much. And it's $42 for a kids' game, you know, plus shipping, plus everything else that goes along with it. And that's a lot for a kid's game. Like, I, that's a lot for a kid's game that I'm not sure if my kids will like or my kids will be too old by the time this actually gets delivered, you know, over a year from now. So uh, they say July 2022, but let's be honest. First time producer, I think. Um, it's probably going to be after that. So anyway, that is Game of Hunt. Check it out if you're interested. Now, I've talked about this one as well on the roundup uh, of the upcoming games, and this is Shazan Azadi. Now, this is interesting because this is actually two different things in one. You can get the standalone expansion, or you can get the expansion for the original Shazan. So that's the big overview, but what is the nitty-gritty, as they're almost three times their funding goal at almost $90,000 right now. This is a very interesting completely different concept than a lot of other stuff we've seen out there. And I think that's why it's attracting a lot of eyes. And I think that's also why it's attracting a lot of funds. But let's be clear, it's also a very expensive game. Now, the one thing I will say right off the top of the bat, having looked at this page, I am really encouraged. And I really like seeing this, that they're going, okay, now some people are going to look at this as a negative. I'm going to look at it as actually a positive. They have said, okay, if you just want to get this standalone, it's $125. Now, I won't talk about the price exactly here, but I'm talking about the concept. But on below this, they have, if you have the base game already, if you want to get just the new stuff, the new stuff, the pledge level, I'll find it here in a second. We'll scroll back up so I can break it down. $99. So now, again, price point aside for a second, you just have the other and you want more. Okay, $99. So you're getting a discount. Now I wish, and the reason I'm mentioning this is because I wish things like Aeon's End would do that. Everything with Aeon's End has to be standalone, has to be give you six things of the base that you already have. And that's freaking annoying sometimes, right? I Can you imagine like if every Marvel Champions pack, they were like, hey, here's more dials for the bad guys and the good guys and more tokens. And instead of those packs being $12, we're going to make them 25. Like, wouldn't you start to get really irritated after you buy a couple of those small packs? Anyway, but that's my illustration on that side of things. 
but let's talk about what this game is. This is a politically motivated thriller where they say you are taking, instead of the tale of the oppressor, you are taking the tale of the oppressed and telling it that way. You are the resistance going up against the imperial uh, bad guy, the imperial army, uh, the imperial, you know, reign. And so what you're going to be doing is you're going to be trying to forge an area majority alliance of voters in these certain areas, these districts or zones, as they call them. And as you get majority, then when you first make yourself more of a threat, the Imperial starts to activate their war machine or their political machine or their whatever machine to go against the threat to try and snuff out the resistance that you are providing. And so that's where this comes in. And freedom, liberty, and independence is the Azadi meaning in the first place. And so that's what you're trying to do, is you're trying to overthrow the Imperials via revolution. So what is it going to cost? Okay, great. Uh, you know, they talk about the game system here, how you're going to be doing it. You're going to be having these political ideologies. And based on your political ideology and how you proceed with those decisions, you will unlock certain powers, unlock certain abilities, and sort of forward your movement in the first place in that sense so again proposition for the revolution dissident you get uh, ways of reacting and then you get different ways of taking them on so there you go uh there is a rule book and so you can take a look at that too this is a big rule book though it's a 48 page rule book so this is not for uh you know light reading side of things this is a uh, heavy bedtime uh you know sit down and relax sort of reading as well but I like the fact that they have it. They have it on Tabletop Simulator in addition. And I mean, I guess the biggest question is whether or not it's worth the price point because clearly people think that it is and they want to do it that way. Now you're going to be using uh, some of these real events as well as they talk about here, the Egyptian Revolution, South Asian Independence, American Revolution, and the Russian Revolution. They're going to be cards within this expansion in the first place. So they're utilizing real events and real ideology that went along with this as they pervase it and again this is like 432 cards right here it says so that's a ton that's a freaking ton on top of all of these 32 cards as well so you're looking at easily over 500 cards with all of this said and done so i mean that's again that's expensive and then you're getting some of the resources here and that's more of the standalone so you're getting a lot of the other stuff that you might not have if you don't have the base game and I, I, one thing I'll say about this is I'm really not a big fan of how they set up this page because you can see I'm going through all of the what's there. Then I'm getting the stretch goals. Then I'm getting the videos and the quotes. And then down here, I'm finally getting to like what the game actually is, the fundamentals of it in terms of how you're going to be using the modular board and the cards themselves and the dissident tokens. And I wish this was at the top. And I'll say that on every single Kickstarter or Crowdfunder, GameFound, whatever I see, because I want to know what the game is, not all the junk that you're giving me at the top. And that's, that's just a pet peeve of mine. But that being said, I mean, again, as a political intrigue, voting, utilizing real life political machinations, this is a very unique game. There's nothing else like it. And the first game is relatively well thought of. Otherwise, this expansion wouldn't be getting $90,000 right now. It wouldn't. Now, is it for me? Absolutely not. This is way too deep, heavy on that side of things for me in terms of the political side of things. My mind just doesn't work well with these types of games. But clearly there is a big host of people that do like this sort of thing and that's why it's doing well so if you are interested shazan azadi check it out next up we have artemis odyssey this is by my local uh publisher this is the grand gamers guild this is the sequel standalone the sequel of course one to five players for the Artemis project. Now, this one is different because you're going exploring into space. This is a remake, a revision of a former game called Ad Astra. So if you're familiar with that, this is a refurbished, fancier version of that, I guess. I'm not really sure what the differences are. I'm not familiar with the base game, but let's talk about what we do know about the Artemis project. Now, again, this is going to have a little bit of Kickstarter exclusive stuff, but I know what the Grand Gamers Guild has done with their previous projects, and they don't do a lot of that. They're just putting out a premium product. There is no stretch goals, so there's much less FOMO on that side of things, but the price point is going to be a little bit higher as well because of that. The retail edition is 55, and the Kickstarter edition is already 65, and the main thing right here, as you'll see below in the pictures, are these miniatures that you're going to be getting which is very interesting because then they say that the retail version is going to just have wooden pieces. And frankly speaking, I don't mind wooden pieces. I actually like wooden pieces. I enjoy them. And so, uh, you know, I'm not sure how I feel about this uh, plastic side of things. And 
if it's going to be less or potentially even less than the 55 at retail and maybe not have to pay shipping, like if I could pick this up locally, which actually they let me pick up one of the last games locally. And so I could probably get it without the shipping there. So maybe that negates the price difference anyway. So the stars, the planets, what you're doing in this game in a nutshell is I'll pull up the rules book here. You have right here, this player board right here, this planning phase, and you have these cards in your hand and you are taking one of these cards and you are laying it face down on this track. Now you'll notice that if you look very carefully at the at where I'm pointing with the mouse, the blue player selected here and the red player selected here. So you don't have to play them in order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. You can play them anywhere. And when it's filled, then you gradually flip them over in number order and everyone, everyone takes the action on that card. But the person whose card it is gets a little extra bonus, extra resources, extra actions, extra movement, whatever it may be. And so they go through all of what the actions are, and that's the planning board. And then, okay, here are your productions. And so that's what produces and what planets. And then you get to move. You get to move one of your starships onto a planet in one of the three systems shown on said card in the first place in terms of if it was a move card. And then other people can follow you. And if you're going into a system where cards aren't revealed, i.e. the planets aren't revealed, then you get to peek at which ones you want and you can choose which ones you want. Because if you get a certain type of planet, it's going to give you a certain bonus as the first one to discover it. Whether it's a production planet, an alien artifact planet, or anything else. So that's really cool. And then you can trade. Okay, you have trading resources that you're going to be doing here. And then building based on those assets in the first place. And all of these give you various ways to get more resources. They get you victory points. All of that sort of thing that you need to know. And the game goes until either all of the planets are discovered or somebody reaches 77 victory points. I There's some explanation of in the Board Game Geek rules section. Uh, I think this is actually higher than what Ad Astra was for various reasons. But that is... The gist of the game in a nutshell and so here you go the other thing that you need to know is if you get 42 then a discovery of alien artifacts takes place and the player with the lowest victory points draws cards equal to the number of players and then keeps one and gives you know sort of a draft in that sense so end of round you get 10 resource cards you have to discard though back if you have too many resources and there you go and that's the game in a nutshell you can play team play for six to eight players there's two player rules as well so, I mean, all in all, as well as the solo, all in all, I mean, it's it's relatively straightforward. There's not a whole lot of mystery. I guess this is another one, though, in terms of how the interaction is and how easy the symbology is to decipher and whether or not I like enough of that moving around. Like, I like the resource management, but I'm not sure I like the moving around between systems and stars and planets and being able to follow or not follow. I That's where I would really uh, have a harder time looking at it from a mechanical standpoint. But, I mean, again, holy cow. I mean, everybody under the sun has, again, a video and shipping is going to be lo local pickup there we go zero bucks for me um but i mean 17 bucks if you're going to get uh just this game so you're talking already 82 dollars again is it worth it from that side of things uh 150 of the funding goal people say so so almost at 700 uh again this is one that i could see getting near 100,000 uh, by the time this ends because it already has 19 days left at this point so if that looks very interesting as a different style of games especially if you were interested in the first one you've never got a copy of it check it out the artemis odyssey now next up we have relics of raha vihara and the expansion montalo's revenge because i screwed this up last week when i did my upcoming video i didn't realize that this was an expansion that this game was already out in the first place and it is and this basically is now this one the expansion gives you 30 new levels uh with three new challenges but this is if you've ever played sort of the video game or the console games where you're manipulating the blocks on the table to try and get them in a certain arrangement to be able to move in a certain path or to get them out of your way without blocking your way that is the tabletop version of that and so if that interests you especially as a solo game because that's what it is you should be checking this out because it's already i mean twenty thousand dollars of a four thousand dollars so it's almost five hundred percent uh funded again as, as a very interesting i can see why people like this i mean this is puzzle uh away from a screen and i would say that if they're doing expansion and they've raised twenty thousand dollars already the first one must be relatively well thought of because otherwise i would think that this would fall flat so it's really interesting to see that they've got 30 more levels and the base game itself has 50 five different floors new twists on each one so you know how you like go on these these tower defense games or these puzzle games or those little like 
uh, quest games like I have I have two on my phone like the Harry Potter one and the Marvel one where you know it's the gems and you're matching them and every once in a while they throw in a new twist or a new power well that's essentially what they're doing here and so that's what you're getting along with this game in terms of the blocks in terms of the little I'm assuming those are like snakes you got the little gear gates that you're trying to go from one end to the other uh so I mean everything that you would possibly need I have no clue like I could see myself liking this but I also don't play a lot of stuff that is designed as solo right now the only stuff I play solo is when I'm learning to teach other people uh from that side of things and so for me this is less on that even though this looks very very solid as a puzzle game because a lot of people like doing these sorts of things. Rulebook is there. I'm not going to go into it. Uh, you can figure that out. I mean, again, it's a puzzle game. It's a puzzle manipulation uh, dexterity-ish, but not really. More of a thinky via dexterity. So uh, there you go. That is it. That is Relics of Rahavihara with the expansion. Check it out if you're interested. Now we finally get to Age Ammonia. This was the most hyped one of the week, let's be honest. And... I've seen mixed opinions all over the board. And I think with these types of games, that's what's going to happen. Period. People are going to have certain expectations, especially since we've seen other ones now. We've seen what Soul Raiders has done. We've seen what um, Iridia has done. We've seen what Lands of Galzir is. And so this is the next in this iteration of different takes on it. Now, this one is more high fantasy, though. And so that is the other main difference. And this is scenario driven, more like Soul Raiders rather than the other two that I just mentioned as well. And it's already $151,000 raised, which is not insignificant. Now, their goal was 118. So, I mean, it's not like anything massive, hundreds of hundreds of percent over uh, their funding goal. But I mean, already it's, it's impressive for one who's never really made a campaign. This isn't someone with a big pedigree who's has six under six other campaigns under their belt of other similar games. So all in all, it's really impressive. Now, as I mentioned, you've got a bunch of people uh, commenting already online that, oh, it's too expensive for what it is. And you see that almost in every high end, high product Kickstarter nowadays. And you saw it with uh, Chronicles of Drunagor. You're seeing it with everything else in between. And I think the other thing that is unsaid nowadays is a side tangent here as I'm rambling. As fingers are coming out, prices are going up, people you're not going to get the same value that you did two, three years ago. You're just not. Inflation, also the cost and the whole shipping side of things, I think people are including some of that shipping cost in the price of the product instead of making the sticker shock on the shipping side of making every shipping like $40. Now, I'm not saying every shipping is, but I'm saying that maybe some of it is incorporated into the pledge level already and you're not seeing it there. And that's also part of that inflation and that cost rising. But that's something to consider. But all I hear is people complaining every single time on this. Uh, so let's talk about Age Ammonia itself. So again, it is like heavily fantasy RPG-esque, and you're finding yourself in this middle of this flood and just trying to work your way out of it. Uh, 99 euro pledge is the base pledge for one to four players. And again, as I mentioned with the other games like Iridia, does this scale well? That is my first concern. If I want to play something like this, is it going to be scaling as well solo-wise as it is at three or four players? Because if there is significant downtime and lag with three or four players, that's a big turnoff for me nowadays. It really is. Because I'm looking for something that flows very, very quickly. Now, granted, it's a scenario-based driven game, so there's going to be a little bit of that side of things. But, you know, it is what it is. Now, this is also going to be, like I said, heavily RPG-based because they are doing ability checks, stat checks, if you will. And so that's the other thing that you need to know. And there's going to be die rolling as well from that side of things. Now, again, it's very similar to Soul Raiders in the sense that you have 30 unique scenarios with evolving maps. And that is very similar, but it's also very different. And that's what you need to be aware of. So here we go. They talk about a little bit of how you're going to be playing. And you got Board Game Coffee talking about it. And the Dizzed. Uh, Dizzed. Awesome. Anyway, um, let's see. Okay, there is a rule book, though. I like the fact that they have a rule book out here. Tabletopia, Tabletop Simulator. Uh, I think the first three scenarios were actually already online prior to the campaign, even. Uh, awesome. We get Tantrum House. And we get an app that is optional. Optional, 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 folks. Uh, just voiceovers. Again, I don't really care about that. Um, you know, if you can really keep track and it's really going to do something like like take off the tediousness of Gloomhaven, great. But if it's just like totally superfluous, meh, I'd rather you spend my money elsewhere. Uh, Board Game Co. has a review. Uh, Dice Tower as approved. Yep, Rado. Okay, so everybody big under the sun. That is why they, they <laughs> turned me down nicely. 
Um, I, I, I'd been pestering them for like almost the past like 10, 11 months since I heard about this game. And um, each time they just nicely said, uh, we'll let you know. <laughs> Which was fine. Um, I realized who I am. But then we had 46 page rule book here. So again, nothing that I wouldn't expect. I mean, most dungeon crawlers are doing this nowadays. I think Chronicles of Drunagor or something like 52. And so it goes through uh, the three tutorials here that you're sort of getting set up for. And then it tells you, okay, what else do you need to know in terms of that? And so hopefully it, you know, lays it out sort of like Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, if you will, if you've played that game. That's what I would hope for in something like this nowadays as sort of the gold standard of layering in things. Now, you can obviously take the learning curve and make it like really steep right away. But especially if you're trying to approach a broader base, like, and if you're going to do that, I'd also make it marketed. Like, I'd throw that all on the page. Like, we are doing BAM to make it more appealing to everybody. And so the learning curve is really easy, even though the rule book is like 50 pages. So again, rolling rolling through what you need to know on the page in terms of your maneuvers and your skills and all of that uh components six heroes that you're gonna be using and your enemy miniatures i mean again i just rather have the standees the setup here the tutorial and now is this i guess the question is is this a complete rule book i guess if you're gonna mark it as like scenarios a three up top but it looks like they are slowly adding some of these other rules in here as the rule book as i score through it uh story cards may be flipped depending on the ability checks Gaining party items, recording your campaign between missions, scenario two. Okay, let's skip a bunch. Let's see what else we can get. Yeah, so it's slowly adding things it looks like. Giving combat examples, giving initiative examples, magic attack examples. So this is a lot of text, actually. Okay, here's setup three. So let's get down here to the nitty gritty. I think it said, like, what, like page 40 where we can start to get the other stuff. So some of the other abilities that you may be getting. Okay, so this is the cool stuff. This is the abilities, the upgrades, uh, rules, reference. That's cool. So uh, index there, uh, player reference here at the end, you know, okay, that looks like a nice summary at the end there. But I mean, let's take a look at this again. Now, if you just want the monster minis, it's 70 bucks, which I could easily pass on. So what, what that means, though, that's that's crazy to me for a second here, 70. And so you must not be getting very many miniatures in this base game for 99 euros, because if you were getting all of these miniatures at this one in this one, that means the rest of the material is only 30 euros, which can't be the case it just can't be so we'll talk about that for a second let's check it out um 100 standees okay there you go yep it's 100 standees as opposed to all of the miniatures here okay so that makes more sense because otherwise that'd be like a huge gap in terms of price point so uh already upgraded in terms of the actual uh, material that they're going with like the double uh, layered game boards uh some of the heroes here Massive world, detailed maps. Is it going to be like Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion with a map? You're going to have a little map that's blown up in terms of cities and then an overview map. 25 different scenario maps. Now, 25 different scenario maps, which is cool, but is that going to be like 70 different scenarios? Or I thought it just basically said 30 at the top. 30 unique scenarios with evolving maps. So, I mean, 25 maps and 30 scenarios. Okay, sure. Add-ons, quotes... All those minis for 150 euros again like that I'd, if i'm gonna get the low price point which is the only one i would consider at this point and again especially like i like the idea of sundrop but who's gonna do sundrop is it gonna be awakened realms like who's doing the actual sundrop here if you're doing your own sundrop for the first time that would make me a little bit concerned all in that's a ton of stuff okay 200 euros good gosh uh puzzle that's gonna be some stretch goals here Larger scenario in the tabletop simulator. First level experience. Uh, different summons that you can be getting. Chip upgrades, action upgrades, new monsters, new boss scenario. Okay, so, I mean, so a little bit of everything. And I guess if these are exclusive, that would be the main reason I would potentially be interested in getting, getting it right now. But if some of these aren't exclusive, that's where the question would be. Because again, the shipping is going to cost you a ton. So it's going to be a third of the price, essentially, on most of these levels. The higher, obviously, it's a little less, but still, that's a ton of money. So, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to have to read the rulebook a little bit more. I'm going to have to probably watch a little video of people playing it. I was super pumped about this beforehand. I'm just, you know, as these games have come out, like, none of them has really, 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 really struck my fancy. Like, they all look really solid, and they all look really great for certain people, but none of them strikes me as, this is the one game you absolutely must have in this line of thinking. So... 
all, all in all, I mean, yeah, I, I got it saved. It's going to go down to the wire for me. I'm going to be looking at it more after I do this video, but I don't know. It's interesting. I can see why it's at where it's at, but I can also see why it's not higher. Let me know what you think as you've seen the campaign page now. So Age Ammonia, there you go. So next up, we have Arcosa, which is a relaunch. This is the bunker building game where you're on a foreign planet trying to fend off aliens, but also trying to build your bunker to survive. Now, they're almost 50% funded, which I believe is more than they had last time. And so it's interesting to see uh, how they're different this time, as well as uh, it's a long campaign. So you've got four weeks. So are they going to slowly creep up? What is it going to look like from that standpoint? Let's check it out. You're trying to basically um, survive on this planet. So on Arcosa, developing bunker, recruiting colonists, and keeping your population fed, happy, rested, and uh, the most important thing, breathing. Now, Tableau action building game where you have the highest reputation. So you're going to be trying to do things that are going to be helping you, but your workers have skill sets that are going to help you, but also kind of rub each other the wrong way. So you got to be careful about uh, rationing things as well as even uh, maybe keeping the peace as well via, if you've ever seen BSG or The Expanse, maybe airlocking somebody. Okay, so what are you getting here? 106 unique events, building those rooms of your bunker and making tough decisions about how things are flowing and where they're positioned all around, keeping your colony with the needs that they do because it's going to affect morale, which is going to in turn affect your ability to use those workers and, uh, you know, take care of things. So accumulating the reputation by uh, bribes and uh, the resources that you're going to need. And what are you getting exclusive? Um, let's see. It's entirety. They're just saying, we're only going to make this many copies. Okay. A little bit of everything, a little bit of everything, a couple of videos. I think the rule book right here. Let's play. Awesome. So what you're doing on the selection side of things is you have foundations, rooms, leaders, and uh, founding, co founding colonists. And uh, that's a lot of different combinations they say that you can start off the game with, which is going to make each game a little bit unique in that sense, as well as the events that we mentioned up at the top. There were about 106 of as well. So three game variants, including an advanced mode and a solo mode. Um, interesting concept. I, I'm not a big fan of the artwork. I, I The color scheme is just not me. I know people like this, especially like the Dinosaur Island-esque vibe. But for me, it just doesn't really uh, float my boat. But um, clearly, they put a lot of work into this. And like I said, they're already 50% funded. So what's the price point on this one, by the way? Let's check. Uh, $49. Okay. And nope, that's it. That is Arcosa, a bunker building board game. Uh, if you're interested, check it out. Next up, we have Dungeons of Infinity. Now, again, this one is flown under the radar, but it's already got some really good hype. It is the ultimate uh, quick overhead, easy setup, boom, boom, boom sort of dungeon crawl, if you will. It sort of gives me that vibe with a D&D RPG-esque flair. And they're already over $100,000, which is really impressive. And the first edition really flown under the radar from Sky Kingdom Games here. And the things you need to know, I mean, it's basically you're setting up this board, you're setting up these modular areas, these maps, and you have what 10 different characters or so in the base game. And then there's an expansion. And that's what this campaign is really about. This, this Kickstarter campaign is more for the expansion, which is $39. Uh, additionally. Now, this is sort of along the lines of Machina Arcana with the third edition versus the second edition. They're giving a discount of $20 of the base game if you have a first edition, if you want to get the second edition, or you can get the upgrades, but the upgrade is like $39, which is the price of the whole new expansion. So I'm not sure how I would feel about that if I was a first time around backer. Uh, but, you know, there's 30 different scenarios in the base game and 12 one-offs. Again, one thing that I could not tell reading through this page was they say it plays solo, fine, easy to tell, competitive, okay, that's the issue, and cooperative, because cooperative, I mean, it's cooperative, right? You're fighting against the enemies, you're fighting against the Dungeon Lord, but nowhere on here does it really give me the best sense of how it becomes competitive. Like, is it like Marvel Legendary, where you slay the most and you get? Are you actually going against head-to-head -head with some PvP? That was what I wasn't able to really tell, because it gives a lot of quotes, it gives... Um, just some general overviews of what you're doing and how you're sort of going. Now, the interesting thing is the initiative order is done differently. Now, if you roll low on the initiative order, if you're the lowest, you can choose to go first or last. Then you have these various actions, walking, examining, fighting, retreating, snout, <laughs> sneaking, or using your asymmetric abilities, interacting with the uh, terrain and the uh, objects that are in there, including chests and bodies as well after they've been discovered and you're just leveling up and when the threat meter gets to zero uh the dungeon lord comes out and you have to fight him 
So again, here are all the characters, uh, a little bit of everything. Again, $69 for the base pledge with standees. I think it's $89 for the miniature version. And again, the question for me, I, I love the concept of this game. Just something I could just whip out really quickly and be able to play with anyone, anytime. I mean, it's the, got the, excuse the comparison, the Cthulhu Death May Die vibe, right? Where, you know, you can just mishmash those together, whip out the tiles that you need on the table and go and play. It doesn't need to be this extensive, very intrinsic campaign that's very intricate and all of those sorts of things. It can just have fun with it. Now, obviously, the expansion is just going to offer more of this. Two new heroes, 18 more dungeons, and three new locations that you're going to be exploring, as well as some bad guys. And a little bit of upgraded in the second edition in terms of the game trays and the redesign of the cards and all of that. Here's the two new characters, which is, again, it's really weird that they're making the female character her class. I mean, you see the classes, all of these other ones, right? It's like Ice Mage, Fire Mage, Paladin, Ranger. And then the last two in this new expansion are King and peasant, which is really weird. Uh, again, the redesign there, a uh, couple, I mean, I guess a couple paid previews, uh, paid preview, paid preview, best of playthrough, paid preview. So I, I, I would have liked to see more from that side of things. I took a look at the quick start guide, which I mean, it's fine. It's a quick start guide, right? Uh, but I don't see any real great thing on the page that tells me more of the actual game flow or what the competitive side looks like. And so that would be the one thing I was wondering. They have a couple add-ons down here. Metal coins! And the Stonebound Saga Hero Pack, which is something else completely. Two heroes from Stonebound Saga, which is a whole other game, campaign, that sort of thing. I mean, it's super intriguing. Super, super intriguing, especially with the Cthulhu Death May Die by, but why am I getting it now? I mean, I know the, the availability may be limited, Maybe at a retail side of things because I haven't seen it before. But otherwise, you know, like it's also a hefty price to pay. Or for someone for me going in, which I'm going to guess what is the full price here if I get the first and the new expansion. Because gosh knows I'm going to get the expansion, right? So it would be standy all-in version is, ah, no. Yeah, $99. Okay, that's actually less than I was expecting. Uh, the gameplay all-in with the miniatures is 109 and the everything, everything is 135 So 99 uh, that's a more palatable than I was thinking. But... Again, we'll see. Now, next up, we have Soul Forge Fusion, the hybrid deck game by Richard Garfield. And you may know Keyforge, you know Magic the Gathering, and this is another spin on that. And now this is 120,000 plus in right now. And the interesting thing about this game is you're basically taking two decks and smashing them together, and there's going to be level ups that your characters are going to have each round, sort of to escalate the uh, dramatic effect and not to allow turtling and to make the game flow and keep it moving and keep it fast so that uh, you can get multiple games in and it doesn't feel like it's a slog or an overhead side of things becoming the issue and so i mean i don't know i don't know 40 dollars gets you a starter kit and 65 dollars gets you like this starter kit plus play mat plus dice like i don't really want custom dice on kickstarter and that's the thing that I don't understand the, the price point on this one. I think it looks great and I'd love to be uh, interested in it. But especially as especially as the marketing side of things where they say, none of these decks are the same. There's so many of these cards. Like, I'm just going to get a random crapshoot, right? And that was the problem with Keyforge is that despite having this randomization, the four unique decks that you're getting in this starter tier, which essentially only plays two people because like I said, you're smashing the decks together, right? To be able to play. So you have... A combination of several different ways that you can play it just with one starter set but that's not really a lot and that's what worries me about it from a price point standpoint especially if one of these four decks is considerably stronger than the other uh whoever gets that deck is gonna be better and that happened with keyforge i mean it's not like huge gradients but there were definitively decks that people looked out for after it became a little bit more known in the meta side of things and the bundle makes no sense to me i'd never go for the the bundle especially with a card game i don't need a play mat i don't need special dice just give me regular dice i can pick them up you know for 6.99 on amazon or uh at my local game store you know from that side of things and then there's just a retailer tier and i, I don't know i guess i just feel weird about that side of things about getting now just two booster boxes, essentially, or one booster box with four decks, you know what I mean? Because I would really want like three or four of these potentially. Um, so I could have like eight or 10 uh, different decks that I could mix and match over time. But that's, that's $100. And uh, comparatively for cards in other situations, that's nowhere near the price point. And so I love the idea of this. And you know, I'm going to remind me on it. But I just don't know. 
like you can see the levels and how they level up and the unique combos that you can do. I mean, it all seems great from that side of things. It's just the price point. And the reason they say one of the reasons to back it now is you get on this online tournament, which I'm I'm not a I'm not a big online tournament person. But I mean, here you go. This is the gist of what I was mentioning earlier. Shuffle your level one decks together, choose your Forgeborn, which is your like mage leader dude, and draw five cards. Only play two, choose wisely, and they become more powerful in the future. And each three turns, you shuffle your deck and upgrade. So, I mean, the concepts behind it, I'm really excited about. I think that should be really fun. Again, a lot of paid stuff, it looks like, previews, and a little bit of the background. And then that's about it. So, all in all, like I said, I'm going to have this one saved. And I'm going to watch this one until the end. But I just don't know if I can commit to it, especially with the price point for the limited um, access that you're getting in terms of the decks. But it looks amazing from that side of things. So, there you go. Soul Forge Fusion hybrid deck game. Next, we have the spill. What do you need to know apart from the fact that it is already almost 200% funded? Well, it's a very interesting premise, and I really like the premise here, but I'm not quite sure about the execution, so let's talk about that for a second here. It is what they call a reverse tower defense game, and essentially, if you want to think of it more like an anti-tower defense game with a mix of pandemic, that's how I'd best describe it, because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be dropping dice in the center of this tower. Now, again, that's what you need to be aware of, because the dice are going to, the dice are going to uh, randomly roll, and so they, depending on what number you can see already here on the outside of this board just on this picture that's where they get allocated and that is to represent the oil being spilled from this pipeline uh, that's leaking the spill the name of the game in the first place and so how you can mitigate that and the specialists of these little yellow green red meeples that you can see also around the outside at the various locations uh, allow you to mitigate that and get rid of them and protect the marine life and so that's the question is how do you like that side of things i mean because i i talk about this with the loop where you're dropping these red random cubes and people are just going to get screwed sometimes and that has the the pensity uh in this game to also happen and so that's the issue is do you like that sort of mechanic that chaos mechanic that you just can't control now you're going to mitigate it and it's very pandemic in that sense like i mentioned but the die dropping and the die rolling in that sense because essentially this is a dice tower in the middle if you want to think just you know make it really straightforward and that's what it is and it's just representing that and how well you mitigate it is exactly what you're going to be doing in this now again 45 dollars great that's fine. That's a bunch of dice. Specialists, five specialist cards, resource cards, um, the wooden to the regular tokens, and then they have upgraded tokens down here for 60 bucks. Again, that's cool. Add-on playmat is also cool. Um, the problem being, again, all of the videos down here, and they talk about, you know, the how you the number determines the placement and all that stuff that I just covered. And too many spills or too much accumulation ends in disaster. There's three win conditions as well. Uh, these all appear to be uh, somewhat paid videos down here, again, so that I just don't have a good sense of where things are at and what it looks like more, again, that seems to be the prevailing trend nowadays on campaigns. So uh, shipping is fine. Shipping is what it is. Now, the interesting thing when you pull up the rule book, though, that I want to mention out as well is... It says choose four specialists of the five that are available. Again, not a big deal. But unlike Pandemic, it does not allow you to mitigate how many specialists you need to take. So if you're playing this solo, like it says, you can play it one to four players. But you have to control all four specialists if you're playing with one person. And so it is not scalable in that sense. So you just need to be aware of that because I know some people don't mind doing that and some people that's a turnoff. Like if I'm playing a one player or a two player game with four characters, I, I just don't want to do that. Or some people manage that well and some people don't. And so again, that's why I think nuances like that are important reasons to have the rule books up because otherwise you would not know that necessarily from firsthand. And I don't know if any of those videos are going to cover that. Like because a lot of those videos may play with two or three or four people or they may glaze over just the general overview of how you play rather than the nuances of what you're doing in that sense when you're playing. Just like any other pandemic game, uh, you know, there's a spill phase. There's the, the bad guy phase. Then there's your phase. Then what happens at the end of your turn? And then you check whether or not you win or lose. So, I mean, it's very similar in that sense to what you would normally expect. I mean, you're dropping those eight dice. And you're checking for spill outs, you're checking for, um, you know, whatever it is in pandemic as well. When you have too many cubes in the same area, it's the same dice, same concept there. So, I mean, it's just taking a different theme, it's taking a different mechanism and sort of spinning it a little bit differently. Instead of traveling around a map, you're traveling around the circle instead. So, again, 
four action points, very similar, uh, five different actions that you're going to be doing, as well as I'm assuming the asymmetric abilities of the specialists in the first place. They tell you exactly. Now, the interesting thing here is that unlike Pandemic, the different action points, the different actions cost different action points. And so a majority of them cost one, but you can see removing an oil dye or rescuing an animal cost more. So again, like how you're going to mitigate that in that sense. So uh, extra actions, you can adjust the difficulty, but uh, that's it. That's the spill. So if you're interested, I mean, I can see why it's funded. Looks like a solid game. Just again, those concerns. So check it out if you're so peaked. Next up, we have Pixel Clash, one to six players, uh, fantasy 8-bit uh, sort of graphics where you are playing a team of anywhere between one to six uh, heroes going up against a particular dragon. And that's basically the concept. It's a play one card, draw one card sort of thing where you do your turn and then the dragon does their turn. Now you can see that there are different dragon decks and the number of players determines how much health the dragon starts with. Now again, you start your hand playing cards. Each round, draw, play, draw, play dragon, resolve cards in priority order, and that's it. Reward tiers here. Again, t-shirts or the game or two copies of the game. If you want to get a custom player card, there you go. Price points for one copy of the game. Early bird is $24. And $28 if you're not. All in all, there you go. That is Pixel Clash, one to six players. If you're interested, check it out. Okay, so let's talk about the next one, and this is EOS, Island of Angels. This is a engine building with worker placement that you are taking on one of the six asymmetric crews slash nations traveling to this island trying to unlock the rest of the angels, and demons are going up against you trying to stop you from doing so. It is already 200% funded, and there is an early 48-hour early bird, so if you were interested, you should probably have checked it out prior to watching my video. And so let's check out exactly a little bit more of what it is. I'm backing right now for the early bird and so we'll see what happens from that side of things like i said you're taking on the role of the captain with this crew upgrading them trying to fight off these demons and monsters trying to bring back the light of the world and there you go 90 minutes 30 minutes for player two to five players overall uh the rule book is up as well as tabletop simulator so you can get a better sense there are two different pledge levels uh base game 49 euros 64 euros including the expansion and you're getting a little bit of exclusives here in terms of the upgrades. Uh, you can see just basically it looks like uh, component upgrades right now. Um, the asymmetric nations here that you can see. They run through all six of those. Here's the expansion. And the expansion gives you two more nations. Uh, I think that's the total of six, maybe. Uh, core concepts. So what are you actually doing with this game? Now, in the base game, they say, okay, so maybe seven total. Uh, five asymmetric crews. Free angels of old. So... How are you doing that, though? You're upgrading your heroes, improving their actions, lowering costs, or getting bonuses. And some of the paths are guards by demons, offering treasure. And, you know, it's about planning, but, you know, they say it's also about fun. So, I mean, there's not like a... And that's my concern in a game like this. Is there a, an absolute best? Like, or can you just do any route? I mean, that was my problem with a game like City of Kings. Like, where it was, you need to do this path, X, Y, Z, every single time, or you just can't win. You just can't. And so I like seeing it from that side of things. Now, again, you can add angels. There are demon lords that curse you or weaken your engine and all of that sort of thing. And so you get a basic overview of what it actually is when you take a look at the gameplay side of things here. Each round, choose a hero, activate. Heroes do different actions. You not only have to plan the actions, but you have to plan the route that you're traveling in the first place. And so you are going to increase rank and morale to get them to stronger abilities or easier paths. So what are you actually doing though? I mean, I give you a nice overview, but let's take a look at the actual rule book so you can see. Okay, so prepare the action. You have to do a different prepare action than the last round. And this is important because, you know, in other games where you can do the same thing over and over again, it becomes a little samey. Uh, move the worker to a different hero than it was on before and then pay for whatever you're going to do. Boom, easy, straightforward, right? end of turn there's iconography so you need to be aware of that and then it goes through a little bit of what these prepare actions are what the blessing actions are some of the angel actions that you're going to be having the hero actions themselves uh the ranks of the abilities that will you'll be able to use and you can see that each of these ranks has several different things going on so the interesting thing to know about this is that based on what you pay that's how much you get 
So if you pay 16, you get all three of these things. You don't just get the far right one. And so you're paying for what you get. And so if you have all the ranks unlocked, then you can get all of the abilities. And as you see, as you go up, there's better and more. That also happens via morale that you can do as well. Each hero has a morale track. And a little bit of all the other stuff that you can be doing in terms of the different character types and the different battlings and scouting and, you know, officer actions. So again, upgrades, details and clarifications. Now some of the angel stuff that you're going to be dealing with. Here's the sailing aspect though, because like I said, you're going to be sailing as well, sort of plotting this course out and seeing how that goes in addition. Uh, moving your ship into adjacent areas. Uh, you can just move up to as many areas as it says and then kind of goes from there. Now, you also have journey cards, which are sort of like your quest cards, if you will, that they may either give you a one-time use or they may be more for endgame scoring. So again, things you need to know. You can enter demon lord areas as well, and you suffer an attack and have to deal with the attack and um, just everything that goes along with that. The epic adventures are, you know, <laughs> epic adventures, high risk, high reward. And they run through some of the default ones here that you're going to see, as well as, uh, you know, explaining them, explaining the rewards, just so you that you know how to deal with demons, what happens when demons attack, uh, the chronicle track uh, that goes and gives you benefits along the way as you achieve certain things, and then they break down the demons. So, all in all, it's a relatively straightforward rulebook. It's really easy to read. So, FYI, if you're looking at it from that side of things, uh, definitely check it out. And, like I said, the exclusive content seems to be mostly upgraded components right now. So, uh, we'll see. First stretch goal isn't until 60, so we'll see where that puts it to. Um, but there you go. That's EOS Island of Angels. Okay, that's it. That is everything. Uh, Long-winded, longer than I was expecting, but hopefully more complete instead of me just fumbling through the pages, actually giving you information about the game and information about things you need to know about the game. So I tried to be a little bit more prudent in what I was telling you, even though it was a little longer-winded than I hoped. Uh, as always, uh, upcoming tomorrow is uh, the upcoming video for next week. So check it out if you're interested. Hopefully I'll have something a little else-wise that you can look at too. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we'll see where things go. I was wondering about just dedicating a video too about just TV shows. I like talking about TV shows as well. And um, I don't know. That's just me. But um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. You'll see if it comes out, right? <laughs> uh, but that's about it. I don't really have a whole lot else. Um, help me help me get to 5,000. That's all I got. Uh, have another video out, hopefully, for the Patreon folks this weekend as well. So hopefully your week is going well. Hopefully your week uh, isn't too bad at all. And hopefully you're not uh, feeling too bad after getting off a hopefully long Labor Day weekend in the first place. It's a short work week from that side of things anyway. So that's all I got. Nothing else. No more ramblings. No more rants. Stay classy. Have a great day. I'll see you around.